Okay, so chapter seven, event animation. We're gonna continue now with the nodes uh, that uh, put this together. And our primary node, uh, the one that drives everything else is time sensor. And so uh, you really can think of time sensor as the heartbeat or the clock that drives uh, an animation because it is spitting out events with every frame that will synchronize any node that cares to hear it so that they always can be aligned with the local computer clock so they can be driven either in parallel or in series as, as they're uh, changing. Now what's interesting is time sensor doesn't give clock values by themselves but rather it gives a fraction. It gives a fraction from zero to one. And the reason why we do that is so that we can control the interval and adjust that smoothly, adjust that easily if we want something to proceed faster or more slowly. If we wrote all our functions in terms of absolute time values or even relative time values, it would be hard to do that because time is always changing. So uh, instead we uh, uh, unitize it, we go zero to one. This may sound familiar, we did the same kind of thing with uh, texture coordinates. And that kind of uh, intermediate normalization lets things be much more uh, interoperable without breaking anything. We, it still gives us full control. Okay, a further thing that tracking the internal clock of the computer gives us is that when these time values go out on a scale of zero to one but still going out they might be going out at every frame but they're not giving a frame count instead they're giving a clock value a clocked value that's been shrunk to zero to one this means that if this machine is running a little faster than that machine or slower than that machine, all three will still see the same behavior. Because as the clock pulse arrives, frame by frame, its fraction interval is going to be a little different to account for that, to account for the different screen refresh time. So this is a very powerful part of X3D. And People usually don't even notice it because they go, oh, look, everything just works. Yeah, so that's good. Doesn't always just work with some other systems. Some are very dependent, typically intentionally, on how fast is your frame rate or how, smooth, how, how fast is your machine. We're independent of that. We want the renderings to be consistent, to have the same behavior. It takes five seconds for the duck to walk from one end to the other instead of walking really fast or really slowly, depending on your machine. Okay. Now because we have designed for that, people who want fixed constant frame rate, who say, yeah, yeah, I know, thank you, you did that, but I want fixed frame rate because say, um, recording a video, and I want it to be perfect. You go, oh, okay, fine then what you're looking for is a specialty mode in the browser and you're seeing see some of them provide these right now xg3d has a way to turn it on uh, but at some point we'll integrate into x3d edit some of the other tools uh, when you launch them you can see that they offer you a video recording capability some are charging money for that that's fine and wh what we do is we call that uh, a special name it's called offline rendering meaning that it's offline means it's uh, well that doesn't look very neat does it that means it's not real time Okay, offline rendering means it will definitely keep track and draw the pictures, not to the screen, but to a file, 
to a series of files or a movie file and render that as, as a canned set of images. Okay, but that's not our normal mode, that's a specialty feature. We're usually smooth and right on time. Okay, so uh, what's next? Time sensor. Here is the output. And we said that fraction was the field name. And we said that 0 to 1 was our output. And then we said that cycle interval is the period. The time interval, the duration of how long does it take to go through a single iteration. So it's simply a ramp function when you plot this out. And uh, if you're, if your uh, loop parameter is true, then you'll get multiple loops. Otherwise, you'll just get the first single sawtooth. Okay, now what's the uh, algorithm for this? Well, we show it here in the margin. This is also uh, uh, spelled out in uh, the notes for this page. So let's go there. He says confidently. Time sensor, notes. If you're looking at the PDF, these will just be printed out for you. Okay, so this figure is in the book and it's here in the notes and it shows you what we call pseudocode, meaning it's almost like actual software, but it's written to be in a sort of a programming language neutral form where it's just notional. So we see that our uh, we figure out how many loops are needed by figuring out our duration and how far along are we and uh, that fraction is uh, from number of loops is how far we go because it might be more than one loop that we're into and then if we're at the beginning we say our fraction is zero if we're at the end, or we're all done, we're at fraction is one. Otherwise, the fraction value is simply that residual of what were the number of loops for time now versus start time divided by cycle interval. So there you have it. Might look a little hard, but uh, the more you look at this thing, you go, "Oh wow, this could not be a simpler." algorithm and that's why we get a very simple straightforward output. So time sensor is a workhorse that's not complicated at all. It just gives us that straightforward value. If we keep going we could say that okay simple output but now we have lots of switches on top of it uh, that help us keep track of it. First of all we've got our good old enabled field which we saw was part of all of the sensor nodes part of the base node type. So we can turn a time sensor on or off. A rephrase of that. If we can turn the time sensor on and off, we can turn any animation chain on or off. Okay, so you now have a switch, a control switch for any animation that you create. Simply turn off the time sensor is a good way to do that. Okay, second variable, loop, we've seen tells us whether it goes one time or it continues looping. So loop false means single time. Loop equals true means keep going and going and going and going. Cycle interval is that duration. So those are usually the setup values that we have when we create a time sensor. Then we have a bunch of runtime output events. Okay, so these are the guys that we would be routing to other things, either in or out. So start time 
and stop time are inputs. Okay, because if we get a time value from somewhere else in the scene, perhaps the time when the user selected, clicked on an object, then that time value would come in and go either to the start time field, which means go clock go, or to the stop time field, which means stop clock stop. Cycle time is not an input. Cycle time instead is an output. If you are looping, if you are sawtoothing and outputting values, if you are driving your animation over and over and over, you might want to trigger something else when that happens. Okay? So if our, for example, if our time sensor is opening the door, then before the door slams shut, you might want to trigger the light going on or something happening inside. Okay, so cycle time would be how you'd make that little daisy chain, make that little cuckoo clock of one thing reacting to another. Okay, what else do we have? Some more fields. Just as we had start time and stop time, we have uh, pause time and resume time. Okay, and those are interesting because uh, we didn't have them in earlier versions of uh, X3D. I think these came in around version 3.2, 3.1 maybe. Uh, they're certainly not in Vermal. Uh, but that's nice when you want to just hit the pause button on something and then have it pick up where you left off instead of restarting. Okay, so pause time and resume time are value because, valuable because you get to avoid a restart, a restart from the beginning. Okay, then next up is active and is paused. Uh, these are outputs. that occur in response to the input of pause time or resume time. And is active says, I'm running. Is pause says, I've been paused. Because they start with the key phrase is, that means they're a Boolean. So is always implies it's a boolean. My handwriting's a little better than this. Not 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 a lot, but uh, it is a little tricky writing on this thing. Okay, so uh, those are outputs and inputs. Then we have one more output of interest right here, and that is the elapsed time. Okay, and that might be on um, how many seconds into my cycle, or I've run for 83 and a half cycles, how many seconds is that? Okay, so if you want to take advantage of this, you can. Maybe you want to push it through a script to turn it into a string to display it in a text node so you can have a running total of the time for the user. Okay. I think I'm going to change the order on this slide here just a little bit because it makes more sense to brief them in the order I gave you guys. Further, I think that uh, maybe we should move start time and stop time to be right here back to back with pause time. Let's try again.
Okay, I'll finish fixing that later. And I'll try one more way here. Okay, there we go. All cleaned up. What's next? Well, not a whole lot left. That's it. Here's the uh, an example scene, and here's the time sensor editing panel. And uh, sure enough, we can see all our values here. Uh, everything is in seconds. Not very fancy. We haven't thought too deeply about it yet. Maybe we could dress up this uh, panel just a little bit and give you a little uh, minutes to second conversion or something like that. But each time sensor is pretty basic and so we usually don't need much of that. Okay, something else uh, a little curious about this is if start time and stop time, pause time and resume time were simply uh, input events, then they wouldn't appear here on the uh, interface, but they're actually uh, settable. They're uh, input-output. So that means we can initialize them. This is not typical, but it is possible. So you might want to look at the book look at some examples more closely, but sometimes you might preset it with what time will they pause, what time will they resume, uh, so that you can pre-stage an animation like that. That would be uh, advanced, but pretty cool technique. Okay, and here are our tool tips. Uh, of course, maybe the only other thing to look for whenever you have a time sensor is if you do have a time sensor, what else would you need with it? Well, you'd want it to do something, so there would be a node that it's driving and a route between them. So if we look in here for, gee, where is my clock, my time sensor, we'll look in the routes and we'll find, oh, sure enough, here it is right here. And this route is saying, route the color changer, uh, excuse me, route the uh, animation clock time sensor up to the color changer. Okay, so let's draw that line. Uh, here's our time sensor and where'd it go? Here's the color changer. So in this case the route is going to go from here to here and the route is going to send a fraction changed to, let's try that again, to the set fraction of the color interpolator. Okay, so if you have a floating time sensor with nothing connected, that either means you forgot to hook it up or you decided not to hook it up yet. My recommendation would be hook things up right away and set the enabled field equal to false if you're not ready for it to turn on yet. And then set enable true when you're satisfied the whole animation chain is ready for uh, liftoff. Okay, finally uh, tool tips. So we'll go right into the uh, uh, next node for how we could drive this guy and then we'll look at time sensor again right in there rather than jumping out to the scene. So uh, it's probably worth stepping out at this point to refresh where are we, what are we doing, and uh, the answer to that is in our good old animation chain diagram, we were right here 
And now that we have a clock, we're going to go and say, what is our interpolator? And then it's the routes that connect those two. Let's get back to that. So scalar interpolator node. This is our first interpolator and intentionally our, sim our simplest. And so what the interpolator does is gets that fractional input 0 to 1 from a time sensor and then it generates a floating point output. It's SF, so that's a single field or single floating point output. Okay, so if we ask, well, what would we do with a single floating point? We can think back and go, oh yeah, we've had lots of nodes that might have that. For example, uh, the material node has a transparency field. Uh, when we learn about lights, there's uh, brightness factors. Uh, there's a number of things that just take a single float as their value. Okay, so uh, set fraction as ever is the input. As with all interpolator nodes. And then it goes through the uh, linear interpolation, uh, changing that into a piecewise linear function, just as we saw in the first diagram on there. And then it uses a double averaging to get the results. And that's the same for all the interpolators. Let's uh, jump back to that, since that was in a previous lesson. Okay, this is in the concept section of the chapter, and there she blows. Piecewise linear function, it didn't matter, it didn't matter how curved that might be. We can always draw little line segments that approximate it to whatever degree of precision that's desired. Okay, and once we have that approximation, either be it for a uh, smooth curve like this or a stepwise discontinuous but nevertheless functional curve like this, and under the hood, what's going on is the interpolator looks at each pair of points we've defined right there and right there. There's our key array values in the node. There's our corresponding key value arrays. Each pairwise key, key value combination defines this function. So now that we have this function smoothly defined, we can say as our time clock goes forward, we can pick for any point in time. We can compute that point by simply averaging first between our key intervals and then doing a corresponding average between that. Fancy schmancy, double linear interpolation. Let me make it sound easier. How many people can, can compute an average of two numbers? Second question. How many people can compute an average between two numbers? Yeah, same hand. Oh, oh, that's all we're doing. Okay, and as a result, very fast.
Okay. And so there we are. That's all there was to it. That was the picture. That's the description. So let's go to the example now. Okay, uh, as before, we're in uh, chapter 7, which you may have in your favorites. And then uh, I'm sorry, this is not the example I wanted. There are a few of these fish prototypes which are just way too involved. Okay, I guess I have to take that as a uh, as a to do to make a simpler example on this. Uh, let's do that right now. Let's just make one. Does everybody want to make a scene, or are you utterly comfortable with that, or you want to make a scene here? Let's let's just do it. We'll say. Uh, Simple scalar interpolator. Okay, that's good enough on the metadata for now. Clean that up later. Add scene graph nodes. Okay, well, we know there's a transparency field in the material. Let's animate that. So we'll put in a, a nice basic shape. that guy. Okay, we're adding scene graph nodes now. We want to add a shape. Let's make it a uh, sphere. Okay, a basic sphere. Don't need that comment anymore. Now, do we want to add any textures or other things? No, we don't need any of that stuff. So we'll get rid of that. And then we'll say Okay, this is our target. Does the material node indeed have a transparency in it? Why, sure. Right there. Okay, so uh, to get that to work, we need to give it a name. Remember, we're beginning with the end of the line. Here's our target, so let's just go def equals the target material. I usually like putting the node name as part of the def name, and then when you read the routes, you can tell exactly what they're up to. It's a good reinforcing thing. Okay, so what else did we do? I might not get the uh, 10 steps exactly in order here, but uh, if you've got your checklist handy, please check them off as we go. Let's put a uh, clock in the scene, and we'll give it a name since it needs uh, uh, the ability to be routed. So there's our time sensor. And then since we wanted to change the transparency, which is an SF float, we're going to drop in a scalar interpolator, the note in question here. Okay, so let's give this a few values. Let's give it, starting at time zero, we'll uh, start at zero, at time 0 0.5, we'll have a value of one. And at time one, we'll have a value back of zero. Okay, so what kind of function did I just draw here? I drew a triangle function. Goes from zero to one to zero. And I've been saying time, but of course, that's actually fraction. And here's our scalar. And there you go. There's that function. Defined as a pair of six floating point numbers. That was a pretty terse way to define a function, wasn't it? Okay, so we need to give it a name. So why don't we uh, call this a triangle function? You can use whatever name you like. I usually like using uh, camel case, whole words, so that it's self-documenting. It's easier to give things 
give nodes the name of what they're doing and put them right there, self-documenting then the routes, the nodes themselves, tell you what's going on and you don't have to guess later. Okay, so I think we're up to steps 8, 9, and 10 where we're connecting routes up. So let's add a few routes and see if this works here. All right, so our first route we'll add uh, right here. And it says, okay, what do you want to do? Well, let's start with the clock. And let's send that to our triangle function. And notice I only had to pick two things each time. I gave it the names. But it prompted me with, well, I think I know what you're doing, so I'm going to give you the most likely choice. So now it's up to us to confirm, was this right or not? Answer, well, fractional output from a time sensor, sure, that's what we wanted. That's what the time sensor section told us. And then set fraction, that's the input to the interpolator. Oh, okay, well, those all look good. So I'm going to keep... That was pretty easy. Okay. Did it pass validation? Yes, it did. Thank you very much, uh, x 3 edit for giving us that. Now let's add another route. I'll add it right after the first one. Okay, and this time, instead of going from the clock, we want to go from the triangle function, and we want to send it to the target material. And let's look, did it work? Well, triangle function is our interpolator. What output did it give us? Value changed. Yep, that's, that's what we wanted. And further, uh, it matched the... Uh, here, I broke it here, but there we go. It matched the uh, type and access type because they're not in red. If they mismatched, they'd be in red right now. So we've got a match on type and we've got a match on access type. And then we said go to target material, which is a material node. And then it prompted us to, well, I'm going to guess that you want ambient intensity. Why? because it had the right type and the right access type. We go, well, thanks, but not quite right. We want to get a different node. We're looking for transparency. So where is it? Shininess, uh, could work, but no. Oh, here we are, transparency, good. So we've still got our types matching. We've got the nodes we want. It looks like we've got the fields we want. Nothing to do at this point, but say, okay. Still validates. That's another good sign. Uh, is it possible to break validation? Sure. What if I mistype this guy? What if I just called it triangle fun? What happens then? Well, let's check it. Well, it's well-formed XML. How about valid? Nope. It failed. Okay, so XML validation is helping us here on our routes. At least for the def names, it's going to tell us, if I click on that, right where the error is. And so we can go, okay, let's fix that. There we go. All right, so I'll save it. And now let's see our time sensor. Is this going to run or not? Well, I don't know. Did we set the defaults correct on this thing or not? Let's see what happens if we draw it. All right, so XJ3D is not cooperating here. Let's view it out in the browser. See if we can get a sphere in there. Well, that's not too good. You need to save the scene. Oh, yeah, there's some kind of funkiness where uh, the new scene by themselves don't always launch properly. Uh, I think we recently diagnosed a fix for that bug, but it must not be there yet. So let's, I'll save this to my desktop with the name we want. Desktop, simple scale or interpolator. Okay, and even that sometimes gets funky, so I'm going to close it and reopen it. 
simple scalar interpolator. And Fred, thanks for reporting that bug. We'll keep uh, working this one. Uh, You're welcome. So sure enough, here it is here. Simple scalar interpolator. Does it still validate? Yes, so I didn't garble it. So uh, let's try to view it now. Okay, we've got a sphere. And uh, it's not moving. It's not blinking, it's not nothing. So let's look at our time sensor now and see if we can't get this to run. So do we want it to be enabled? Yes. Do we want it to loop? Well, as a matter of fact, yes, we do want it to loop for two reasons. First is just so we can see our triangle function continuing to work. The second is recall that time sensor does not start on its own you either have to give it an input event, set start time, or say loop so that it's going continuously. So I think if we click loop, then it should say, oh, I'm always supposed to be looping, then of course I would start. So fingers crossed here. And not disappearing on us. This might be the XJ3D update bug, so we'll view it externally again. See what we get. Oh my goodness. We'll try it again. See what instant reality can do for us today. Sure enough. It's blinking, or more precisely, it's becoming transparent and then opaque again, not transparent. And it's alternating on a total of one second interval or a half second in each direction. And my oh my, isn't that irritating? <laughs> okay, so there's our simple example. That's how easy it was to put together that's how easy it is to do the 10 steps. After you've done this a few times, you don't have to have the checklist in front of you each time. You get used to what is it you want to do and how do we make it work. So I think we'll add this example as just the simplest possible. Here's how you do it. Okay, so what's next? Well, uh, It looks like we have it on this guy, and in fact, we ended up recreating an example that I guess is in there, and I just hadn't pulled up the right example. The book says scalar interpolator example. So one more set of fumbling, see if we can find, was it there in the first place? Aha. Here it is. So the example we just constructed is in there. This one's better because the sphere is twice as big. But it's the same basic example. We have a target material. We have a scalar interpolator. We have a time sensor. We have a pair of routes. And then we added one more thing. We put some text behind it to label it. That also serves to really highlight the fact that it's a transparency that we're doing. Before it could have been that maybe it was just getting darker and turning to black. Maybe it was a lighting effect. Now since the text is behind it, we can clearly see that it is a transparency effect. All right then, so we've got, uh, let's see where we're at. We're working our way through the animation chapter. We've done time sensor. Come on. We've done time sensor. We've done scalar interpolator. We'll pick up next time with color interpolator and the rest of them. And this exact same pattern will be what we see every time. See that.